All right, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over all the required cases for the AP exam. So let's get it. All right, so the way that the slides are set up for each case is it's going to tell you the facts of the case, then how the Supreme Court ruled, and then what's the constitutional principle. These are the three main things that you need to know and be able to write about for FRQs. So let's start off with McCulloch versus Maryland. This is a federalism case, so states versus the national government. What happened here is the federal government created a national bank, and some states, including the state of Maryland, passed laws that would tax that bank. So the first question is, can Congress establish a national bank? The answer is yes, they can. The reason is important. It's because of the necessary and proper clause, which then allows Congress to have implied powers, uh, so it expands congressional power. The next question is, all right, well, st can states tax the national government? And the answer is no, because the Supremacy Clause asserts that the national government is superior to state governments when the two come into conflict. So in both ways, this expands federal power, weakens state governments. All right, so our other federalism case is U.S. versus Lopez, nearly 200 years later. In this case, a student was uh, arrested for bringing an unloaded gun to school and was charged with breaking a federal law. Congress claimed that the Commerce Clause gave them the power to pass that law. And for about 50 or 60 years, anytime they claimed Commerce Clause powers, they were able to make that law and the Supreme Court rubber stamped it and said, okay, because of commerce, they can do that. In this case, the Supreme Court ruled this law unconstitutional because they said possessing a gun at school does not substantially affect any sort of interstate commerce. Therefore, Congress did not have the power to make this law. States could ban guns in schools if they wanted because the 10th Amendment protects state powers. It reserves powers not delegated to the federal, to the states. So this case rules against Congress using the Commerce Clause, so it limits their commerce powers and it strengthens and invokes states' rights or reserve powers from the 10th Amendment. All right, shifting gears, this is an Establishment Clause case, the uh, here, Engel versus Vital. And schools in New York required students to recite a non-denominational prayer each morning at the start of the school day. The Supreme Court ruled that this was unconstitutional. States cannot hold prayers in public schools, even if it's voluntary, even if it isn't for a specific religion. And the reason for this is that this is, violates the Establishment Clause, which says that Congress cannot uh, establish a religion. They also, as a result of that, can't promote or inhibit religion. So through the 14th Amendment and incorporation, both states and the federal government are prohibited from officially backing religious activities. So this strengthens the Establishment Clause. It strengthens that separation between church and state. Another religion case is Wisconsin versus Yoder, 1972. This, however, is a free exercise case. Wisconsin had a law that required students to attend school until the age of 16. Amish families refused to send their children to high school uh, because of religious reasons. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Amish. They said that compelling Amish students to attend public school beyond eighth grade violates their right to practice their religion freely. So this is a free exercise case. Individuals' interest in free exercise of their religious beliefs outweighs or is more important than the state's interest in compelling or mandating school attendance beyond eighth grade. So again, another victory in favor of religious freedom, in this case, the free exercise clause. All right, sticking with schools for a minute, Tinker versus Des Moines, 1969, we have a free speech case. Students wore black armbands to school to protest the Vietnam War and they were suspended. Um, they claimed that they had free speech to do this and the Supreme Court agreed with them. The armbands represent pure speech. So this is a form of symbolic speech because it wasn't spoken, it was you know, the symbol of wearing the armband. And the Supreme Court said that this was pure speech. Students have a right to free speech at school. In order to justify suppressing the speech, the school would have to prove that it substantially interferes with the operation of the school. And in this case, they felt that the black armbands did not Therefore, the students had free speech and were allowed to wear these armbands. So, the student's right of political symbolic speech based on the First Amendment was more important than the school administrator's concern for potential disorder. So this is a victory, an expansion 
for, of free speech. All right, so next up is New York Times versus the U.S. This is a freedom of the press case, very closely related to free speech. In this case, the Nixon administration was attempting to prevent the New York Times and Washington Post from publishing the Pentagon Papers. This is a 7,000-page document that uh, was created by the U.S. Department of Defense that was detailed involvement of everything that happened in Vietnam, and the government did not want this getting out to the public. The Supreme Court rules against the Nixon administration, against the federal government, saying that they did not have the right to block the publication of the Pentagon Papers. So this is a victory for freedom of the press. The reason here is very important. The last bullet point, because of the First Amendment's freedom of the press, there is a heavy presumption against the constitutional validity of government claims of prior restraint. Prior restraint means censorship, so they're saying essentially that the Supreme Court is, wants to rule against censorship whenever possible, including this case, so this expanded freedom of the press. All right, so Schenck versus U.S. is a free speech case. However, this time the court rules against free speech. Charles Schenck was arrested because he was encouraging people to avoid the military draft during World War I, and he was arrested because that violated the Espionage Act, which uh, prohibited such type of behavior. The Supreme Court actually upheld the Espionage Act, saying it did not violate the First Amendment and that it was an appropriate use of Congress's wartime authority. What they argued is that the First Amendment's free speech clause does not shield advocacy urging unlawful conduct. In other words, if you are encouraging people to break the law, you do not have free speech to do that. And they said that speech could be limited if it creates, quote, a clear and present danger. End quote. So this case limits free speech. It expands federal power, especially during wartime. It's important to note that this case is not current precedent in the U.S. Uh, Brandenburg versus Ohio, among other cases, has reestablished what is and is not allowed for free speech. So I think they want you to know this case because it shows a limit on free speech. It's really your first case that limited free speech. All right, so switching gears to the rights of the accused, we have Gideon versus Wainwright. In this case, a Florida man who was homeless was arrested and charged with a felony. When he asked the court to provide him with an attorney, they refused. So the question here is, do states have to provide an attorney to people who can't afford one themselves? And the answer is yes, they do. So just like the Sixth Amendment says that the federal government had to do so, now states do also. And the basis for that decision is the concept of incorporation. The 14th Amendment in the Due Process Clause says that nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so part of that due process, part of that liberty, is the right to an attorney if you can't afford one. So now states must also provide attorneys to defendants who can't afford one. All right, we come to Roe versus Wade, 1973 one of the most contentious Supreme Court cases in U.S. history. This case was uh, brought to the court because there was a law in Texas that prohibited abortions, with the only exception being to save the life of the pregnant woman. This case established that a woman has a right to obtain an abortion, and this is based on the right to privacy, which was discovered in Griswold v. Connecticut eight years before. So, this right to privacy encompasses the right to obtain an abortion, and this right is also incorporated through the 14th Amendment. So states nor the federal government can ban the right to an abortion. All right, we come to our most recent case, and it is McDonald versus Chicago. Well, we have two 2010 cases, so here's the first of them. In this case, Chicago had essentially banned handguns. They didn't do so explicitly, but any time a person would request and fill out the paperwork to obtain a gun license to receive a handgun, they were denied. And so essentially they had banned handguns. So can states and local governments do this? And the answer is going to be no. The Supreme Court ruled that the Second Amendment's right to bear arms, including for the purpose of self-defense, so not just being tied to militia anymore, it applies to the states. So the simple way to say this is that it incorporated the right to bear arms for personal use, for self-defense. 
So the Supreme Court had previously in 2008, DC versus Heller ruled that there is an individual right to bear arms, and now this incorporates it. Again, the incorporation part based on the 14th Amendment's due process clause, so states cannot take away the right to bear arms either. All right, Brown versus Board, 1954, one of the most famous cases in American history. This was brought to the court because black students in several states were denied being admitted to public schools based on their race. Essentially, we had whites only and blacks only schools, especially in southern states. And the Supreme Court here rules that racial segregation of public schools is unconstitutional, so it required the desegregation of public schools. The constitutional principle is based on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. It says that when Plessy versus Ferguson said that separate but equal is allowed, this is inherently unequal. Racially segregated schools are inherently unequal. This violates the Equal Protection Clause. Therefore, schools cannot, public schools cannot be segregated. All right, so Citizens United is a very contentious case. It's also very complicated. I encourage you to check out the full video on this case. You can get all the details that you need. The quick version is going to be that the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, it banned a bunch of things that people could and couldn't do or say or when they could make ads or when they could give money or how much money they could give for elections. So we're talking about money for elections. And so you have some limitations. And what the court is going to rule in this case is that corporations are people, because Bikra said that they couldn't, corporations couldn't give money uh, to campaigns or to parties. And the Supreme Court here says corporations are people. Therefore, people have free speech, and giving money to candidates and political contributions is free speech. So therefore, corporations have free speech, which means that corporate funding of independent political expenditures cannot be limited. So corporations cannot give money directly to candidates. However, they can create uh, PACs and give to something called a super PAC. So this is the real name is an independent expenditure only committee. And corporations, unions, and interest groups are now, because of this case, allowed to raise and spend unlimited amounts of money. So this case also struck down other parts of BICRA, including a ban on soft money, including limitations on the timing of ads. Um, the result is this has led to a massive increase in the amount of money being contributed to political campaigns. The constitutional basis for this ruling is the free speech clause. And again, because of free speech, corporations have the right to engage in political speech. So corporations, unions, interest groups can give to super PACs and they can give an unlimited amount. All right, next up, Baker versus Carr. In the state of Tennessee, the residents there in 1962 alleged that reapportionment was creating districts of very unequal size as far as population goes. The court ruled, first of all, that apportionment issues are justiciable, meaning that courts do have the power and authority to rule on these issues. And this led to the one person, one vote principle of equal representation. So one person, one vote is the idea that all people's votes should count equally. So therefore, it says that under the Equal Protection Clause, the appellants had the right to challenge this unequal apportionment, and today malapportionment has been determined to be unconstitutional. Shaw versus Reno, another case regarding drawing of congressional districts. North Carolina created a very bizarrely shaped majority-minority district, and the purpose was to actually increase black representation in Congress. The court here rules against this, however, and says congressional districts cannot be drawn based only on race. So race is allowed to be a reason, however, it cannot be the reason for the drawing of a congressional district. Drawing a district based only on race violates the Equal Protection Clause, even if it's drawn to increase minority representation. So the court said that this opposes the ideal of a colorblind constitution. So this is controversial because some would argue that uh, looking at race is only not allowed when it's designed to harm minorities, but if it's designed to help, then it can be allowed. But the Supreme Court rules against that and in favor of a colorblind constitution. Finally, in Marbury versus Madison, kind of the OG Supreme Court case, what you have here is that a man, William Marbury, um, had received a job 
from the outgoing Adams administration and James Madison refused to give him that job. The Supreme Court ruled that the relevant portion of the law that was at question here, the Judiciary Act of 1789, conflicted with the Constitution and was therefore null and void. So the facts of this case really aren't that important. The outcome, however, is hugely important. This case established judicial review. The Supreme Court essentially argued or ruled that it has the power to declare laws unconstitutional. This greatly strengthened the judiciary because now they can rule uh, legislation, presidential and executive actions, and state laws unconstitutional. The principle that allowed them to do this is that Congress couldn't pass legislation that went against the Constitution because the Supremacy Clause places the Constitution above laws by Congress. All right, hopefully this video helps you prepare for the AP exam. Hit that like button if it did. Subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure you guys check out the rest of this series to help you get ready for the AP exam. Until next time, this has been a La Money Production.